Hey, Bill, are you there? I can't wait. Wait, wait, wait. White man's whore. Get the flurries better grab the light vest. <laughs> Kristen. From newspapers to magazines, blog spots to TMZ, and now Stan Twitter, celebrity feuds have been a guilty pleasure for decades. People live for the drama of the rich and famous, but there's something strikingly different when it comes to how these feuds play out based on gender. Unlike women, male celebrities often get to share the spotlight without constant speculation of a brewing beef every five seconds. Yet the media consistently highlights women in competition, feeding into a narrative that pits them against each other. While there is a long list of male celebrities who've exchanged jabs or even had physical altercations, there's something far more sinister about how female rivalries are perceived and reported on, especially when no conflict has been confirmed by the women themselves or the connection doesn't even make sense. And these kind of rivalries sell. It's been shown that public interest skyrockets when women are framed as enemies. On top of that, there's already this idea that there's only room for one successful woman at the top. This creates an environment where women are portrayed as catty, emotional, or incapable of coexistence. And like, I love a good cat fight as much as the next gay, but these rivalries are often manufactured or exaggerated to keep audiences engaged, transforming individual accomplishments into battles for dominance under the public gaze. And I feel like the most glaring example of this is Britney versus Christina in the early 2000s. Now this is obviously before my time, but I feel like this story highlights an important time in pop culture that reveled in a very specific form of misogyny. And although there have been movements that make us believe that we've grown from this era, I still don't feel like we've progressed that far. The timeline begins in 1993. Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera meet on the set of Disney Channel's The All New Mickey Mouse Club. And here's when they started to become friends and quickly formed a close bond, being the youngest members of the cast. Even Christina's mom said they were completely inseparable. The show featured a mix of skits, musical performances, comedy sketches, and special guest appearances. It could be compared to Nickelodeon's All That, which began filming 30 Minutes Away the following year, though All That focused more heavily on sketch comedy. The Mickey Mouse Club was like a boot camp for future entertainers. They were put through extensive dance rehearsals, singing lessons, acting classes, and time in the recording studio. And like all that, the show would go on to be a launch pad for some of the biggest stars of the late 90s and early 2000s, including Ryan Gosling, Carrie Russell, Justin Timberlake, and JC Chavez. Although this has caused the show to have a lasting cultural impact, at the time the show was on a decline. By the mid 90s, Disney Channel was shifting its programming strategy to focus more on original series and films and more narrative driven content. Also, the show's format began to feel outdated compared to the newer, edgier content emerging in children's television and this ultimately led to the show's cancellation. Following the end of the show, Britney and Christina would do what every Disney girl would do after them and started pursuing music. Christina and her manager at the time, Steve Kurtz, were on the hunt for someone to help write and produce a demo to pitch the record labels. That's when they connected with Heather Hawley and Rob Hoffman at Illicit Productions. Now, one of the key things Christina wanted was a ballad. Trust me, this is important, I promise. After talking with Heather and Rob on the phone, Christina hopped on a plane to LAX and got to work. She recorded a song called Obvious and booked studio time to record record five songs in just five days. She was recording leads and backgrounds like she was hungry, rent was due. When music execs got their hands on the demo, they were, well, a bit confused. Here was this 16 year old girl with Aretha vocals and they were like, what do we do with this? How do we sell it? Eventually the tape landed in the hands of Ron Fair at RCA Records. Not long after, Ron got Christina an audition with Walt Disney Records. And after auditioning, she then got the chance to record the song Reflection for the Mulan soundtrack. The song peaked at number 19 on the Billboard Adult Contemporary chart. Following the attention she received with Reflection, she signed with RCA Records and began working on her debut album. At the same time, Britney, who just dipped from Lou Pearlman's girl group Innocence and was under the management of slimy, scummy music business lawyer Larry Rudolph, landed an audition for Jive Records. And from the moment they heard her initial sessions with Eric White, they knew they had something special. So in 1997, they signed her and sent her off to Sweden to work with pop music legend Max Martin. Out of these sessions came what would become Britney's debut single. And in September of 1998, Britney would release the iconic 
culture shifting greatest Greatest debut single of all time time. baby one more time and the song as we know was a hit this might be the biggest debut in pop history peaked at number one for two weeks two times platinum in the u.s topped the charts in over 20 countries best song choice single top selling single of the year and the song has been covered parodied and referenced countless times this and the iconic video inadvertently started the late 90s teen pop boom and set up a very distinct public persona for britney the video got played on mtv and Disney Channel at the same time, showing just how well Britney managed to walk the fine line between girl next door and sexed up pop princess, which is controversial for obvious reasons. Meanwhile, in Christina land, she was still working on her first album, but RCA was kind of worried about her debut. Sure, Christina had the voice, but RCA was struggling with how to market their new star. They needed to figure out how to present this girl from Pittsburgh in a way that would grab global attention. So they spent a lot of time refining and perfecting Christina's image. That's when RCA picked a standout pop track for Christina's debut, another iconic song, Genie in a Bottle. Also a huge undeniable success. It peaked at number one where it remained for five weeks, two times platinum, and sold over seven million copies. She also received multiple awards for it and a Grammy nomination. And this is where the comparisons sort of start. They're both topping the charts with teen radio pop songs, both former Disney girls, young, midriff bearing teenagers, blonde, white, skinny, you get it. But if you really listen to these singles, they are very different from one another. Baby One More Time is raspy, baby voice, very Max Martin bubblegum pop. Even the video, while a bit edgy, still plays into this tween age fantasy. It's very colorful. But Genie in a Bottle is a bit darker vocally and more sultry. The lyrics are packed with innuendo and you can feel the Whitney and Mariah influence vocally. The video was directed by Dion Martell, who at the time was known for working with a lot of R&B artists, and the video doesn't feel like the bright, colorful pop videos at the time. Even Christina talked about how she didn't really want to release Genie in a Bottle. She really wanted her Mariah vision of love moment. Obviously, the clear artistic differences didn't stop the comparisons, and it would only get worse after their album's debut. 12 days into the new year, Britney releases her debut album titled Baby One More Time, and it smashes the charts. The album debuted at number one and sold over 120 20,000 copies, eventually becoming the best-selling album by a teen solo artist in history. It became the fastest-selling album ever by a teenage artist at the time, and Britney would become the youngest artist to have an album certified diamond. This album was the epitome of 90s teen pop. It was energetic and bubblegum sweet with catchy melodies, upbeat tempos, bright synths, just fun, feel-good, sing-along music. And yeah, it received mixed reviews upon release, but it's kind of the album that made Britney the princess of pop. Not long after, Christina releases her self title debut album. While not the same massive commercial success as Baby One More Time, this album was still wildly successful for a teen pop act. It also debuted at number one with first week sales of 253,000 copies, topped the charts in several other countries, and it was pretty much loved by critics. Following their solo debuts, the media wasted no time pitting these two pop sensations against each other. Britney had already become the gold standard in pop music. She was selling records like crazy. Naturally, the media wanted someone to compare her to, and who better than Christina Aguilera. The media was obsessed with this narrative. Britney was the more popular of the two at this point and Christina had the voice which led to a lot of manufactured gossip about whether they were jealous of each other. Going back and listening to both albums is honestly laughable that there were any comparisons because these are two completely different projects. If any other artist had released Christina's debut album there literally would be no comparisons. Britney's album is very stereotypically pop sounding and Christina's is so R&B. Like take a track like So Emotional for example and then compare it to baby's fourth track soda pop maybe you could argue that one of them is a ballad so that's not really a good comparison well let's listen to love for all seasons now my favorite Britney ballad from the bottom of my broken heart now baby one more time also does have some R&B influences But there's a very distinct pop sound still, reminiscent of a sound that you'd hear on like Spice World. Even on a song like Love Will Find A Way, 
I'm not getting Max Martin vibes at all. Like this is very Mariah coded. Please go listen to both of these albums all the way through because I'm not even sure they could be in the same category sonically. This is like if you compare Guts to Short and Sweet. Yes, both artists share similar audiences and they're both unabashedly pop records, but you don't feel those 2020s Jack Antonoff sounds anywhere on Guts. Anyway, this media created feud reached the boiling point when both were nominated for Best New Artist at the 2000 Grammys and Christina ended up taking the award home. Despite all the media frenzy, they were still somewhat friends. Not that they'd even have time to feud because the media was busy dragging them into this beef with a grown man pushing 30, an evil, vile creature named Eminem. If you've seen my last video on Mariah Carey, you know Eminem has a strange pattern of picking on women in pop music or just women in general. His tactic usually starts with suggesting some imaginary sexual relationship. There was never anything between us and you never from just from my house at 5 o'clock in the morning and passed out on my motherfucking kitchen floor. What are you talking about? You know what the fuck I'm talking about? Nothing. I Nothing. Been, look, look, I talked to him. I, you know, have spoken to him a few times, whatever. But in terms of me having like an intimate relationship with, Pete, with you know, men, I can name them all on one hand and he ain't on the hand. Less than one hand. <laughs> followed by the most disgusting verbal attacks in his songs. This time, his targets were Britney and Christina. I met her before and I had respect for her too. There's been some stupid rumors too, actually, that, that are, are not true as, as far as he and I go, but whatever. He's, he's a cool guy. I met him like once at the European MTV Video Music Awards in them. She heard a rumor that I was married. I heard he's married now. m and yeah, totally. And I was like, no, you didn't just say that, you little bitch. Doesn't he have a song about killing his baby's mother? The girl that he talks about killing on his record, actually. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty graphic, like, taking this girl, like, out, like, killing her. You know what I mean? Like, the mother of his child. And it's kind of, like, aggravating to listen to. You know what I mean? It's it's really, I don't know, so, some of his album's kind of disturbing a little bit. She heard a rumor. She didn't know if I was married or not. She just heard a rumor and then put me on blast. Abusive situations are not cool. If you could be someone else for a day who would you like to be Britney Spears underwear <laughs> it's not a person huh That's not a person. <laughs> it could be it might be things living down there but this video isn't about him, so I'll try to contain my disgust for now. Fast forward to the 2000 VMAs. Side note, this is one of the most iconic VMAs nights like ever. Let me just set the scene before we get into the important stuff. First, the iconic promo shoots for the show shot by David LaChapelle. Then you have the Wayans Brothers hosting. Had girls shaking their ass ass all over the place place. And this was just a few months after the first scary movie was released. Then some of the most iconic red carpet looks in MTV history. Aliyah's final VMA appearance in this iconic dress, J-Lo with Redacted, Destiny's Child's iconic trio look, then a very stark contrast with NSYNC's look, pink, just pink, that's it. The Rock, Mandy Moore, Julia Stiles, Tara Reid is absolutely serving, Wyclef is wearing whatever this is supposed to be. And it's moments like these where I wish I had lived through this era in pop culture because almost all of these looks are completely ridiculous, but that's okay because it's the VMAs. I feel like this is what's wrong with a lot of pop culture today. Like I think an MTV red carpet is the perfect place to be tacky, campy, out there, nonsensical. So like when I'm seeing people in like floor length gowns and tuxes i just let out the biggest groan sometimes it works a lot of the times it's like why do you hate fun you have britney and justin heart launching mid show venus and serena introducing the thong song yeah! tim comerford from rage against the machine climbing onto the set and sitting on a 15 foot prop protesting limp biscuits win and then getting arrested during commercial break janet opening the show the army of slim shadies anyway both britney and christina delivered two of the most iconic performances of the night britney performs a mashup of i can't get no satisfaction and her song oops i did it again with this strip tease which was groundbreaking yet highly controversial girl don't went from the mickey mouse club to the strip club go on with your bags now and i was not aware of christina's game yeah i've seen the dirty video and the Candyman video and burlesque 15 times but this girl can really dance like and i'm mad that i was unaware i need the x tina stands to point me to more performances like this fred durst from lip biscuit made an appearance during christina's performance just thought i'd mention that but the real highlight britney and christina finally put all the feud rumors to rest when they came out together to present whitney houston even throwing a slight jab at eminem meeting janet jackson eminem anyway deserved. Whitney presented Eminem with the video of the year award and he couldn't resist taking more jabs at Christina and Britney during his speech. You know I thought it was about to go down right? 
Christina and Britney just came out here. I thought they was presenting the award. I'm gonna take this home and put it right between my Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera poster. Thank you. Despite their VMA appearance, the media did not stop with the rivalry rumors. The supposed feud had already become a pop cultural phenomenon. There's no rivalry between me and Britney Spears. We're good. We're friends. No, she's, she's a cool girl. You know, anytime we see each other at awards or, or even presenting or performing, we, we always run into each other. You know, our schedules are busy. We, we don't get to hang out, whatever, you know, we used to be really good friends in the Mickey Mouse Club, but there's no competition at all. You know, if I'm in competition with anybody, it's with myself and improving my own artistry, but, you know, it's just crazy. Who knows? Maybe you'll see you do that in the future, but there is no denying anything. You know, the possibilities are endless and they're open, but she's just a cool girl, no fighting, but we are two very different artists, and it's just going to take a little bit before everybody, you know, really sees that for sure. Britney's video for Lucky and Christina's video for a Come On Over were competing for the top spot on TRL. At the same time, Christina is growing tired of this bubblegum pop sound that her label is trying to push on her because that's kind of what was successful at the time. You could not turn on MTV without seeing some young blonde singing a catchy, sugary pop song with a mixture of innocence and sex appeal. This rise in teen pop girls can be traced back to Baby One More Time. Teen pop was dominating the music scene. NSYNC sold a record 2.4 million copies in one week with no strings attached, and it was growing bigger and bigger by the week. But Britney was the first female teen pop star to make such an impact that there are a wave of boy bands like the Backstreet Boys and Hanson and teenage R&B and country artists like Leanne Rimes or Aaliyah or Destiny's Child. Naturally, record labels scrambled to find their own Britney-inspired pop princesses and Christina fell victim to this trend. You'd also have young blonde pop tarts like Mandy Moore and Jessica Simpson emerge around this time, but this wasn't what Christina wanted. She started a major rebrand, fired her manager, dropped her first all Spanish album, and began showing a more edgy side in public. With colorful streaks in her hair and a fiercer attitude in interviews, Christina was carving out a new persona, one that was very different from Britney's sweet girl next door image. And this really came to focus after the release of Lady Marmalade, a reworked version of Patti Bell's 1974 classic, recorded for Bass Lerman's Moulin Rouge soundtrack. Produced by Missy Elliott and Rock Wilder, the track featured Christina alongside Lil' Kim, Maya, and Pink. The song in this video marked a turning point in Christina's career and image. The song was already risque enough, and then you have the video and she's wearing this corseted lingerie ensemble, fishnets, big platinum blonde crimped hair, and theatrical makeup. She looks so good in this video, but as with most things in pop culture, drama followed. There was some tension between Christina and Pink during the making of Lady Marmalade, from disagreements over props and choreography to disputes about who would sing which parts. Well, there's Lady Marmalade. I'm gonna put that down here at 12. How come? It wasn't very fun to make. I'm all about fun, and it was like a lot of fuss, and there were some personalities. Mm -hmm. um, Kim and Maya were nice. But despite the behind the scenes issues, the song was a massive success. The video was a hit. They performed at the MTV Movie Awards and the Grammys, and even took home a Grammy for the song. Now this is important, I promise. Lady Marmalade was just a prelude to the peak of the Britney versus Christina rivalry. It's 2000. 2001 and the petty drama continues. In March, Britney's iconic Pepsi commercial debuts at the Oscars. She signed a contract with Pepsi a year prior and basically became the face of the brand. And if you're wondering what the hell does this have to do with Christina? Well, Christina would sign a similar contract with Pepsi's longtime competitor, Coca-Cola, subsequently reigniting the Britney versus Christina rivalry and the famous Cola Wars. There's always that comparison thing, which is really old by now. I'm just bored with the topic now. It's just something that comes with the territory, and she's doing her thing, I'm doing mine, and it's two very different commercials. She's got a point. Britney's was flashy, featured dance numbers, and a remix version of the Joy of Pepsi jingle. It was exactly what you'd expect from a major pop star. Christina's commercial took a more comedic approach. It focused on a guy visiting the set of her latest music video, fainting every time she spoke to him. It even teased the prize that viewers could win as a part of Coke's Pop the Top summer contest. A similar battle of the brand situation would happen when Britney starts doing Skechers ads, and then she like files a lawsuit against them. And guess who then pops up and starts doing Skechers ads? 
Christina Aguilera. By 2001, the teen pop genre was starting to wane. The market had become completely oversaturated with boy bands, girl groups, boy band girl groups, and Britney clones. And people were growing tired of the sound and image. This is obviously not to say that the genre was completely fading away. There was still some success even towards the mid-2000s. But like most things that teen girls love, it was hated. And then on top of that, you have so many people doing the same thing at the same time. People were sick of it. More than they already were, of course. Even Britney and Christina were feeling the fatigue. At 19 and 20 years old, they were ready to grow up and evolve their music. Britney kicked off her new era with what is probably the most iconic VMA performance of all time. She appeared on stage in her most risque costume to date, delivering some of her best choreography. And then, in a moment that would go down in history, she dances around the stage carrying a giant Burmese python on her shoulders. This performance did not go without controversy. The song itself was a clear departure from her usual girl next door bubblegum pop sound, leaning more towards urban pop and R&B. And when the music video was released, it stirred up even more controversy. Britney Spears was no stranger to slut shaming throughout her career. Think about those 12 year olds that listen to your music and think about the 12 year olds who saw you on the VMAs and think what they're thinking. They probably are thinking that it's okay to dress like that, which it's not. We're I not their that. parent, man. It really peaked after the release of I'm a Slave for You. The video was heavily criticized by parents and conservative circles for its overt sexual nature. Britney was accused of being a bad role model, but I'm sure she was used to it at this point. While the song is iconic today and laid the groundwork for the good girl gone bad trope in pop music, it was her first lead single from an album to not crack the US top 10, peaking at just 27. Not long after came Christina Aguilera, with Dirty, the lead single from her album, Stripped. This song, its lyrics, and the video solidify Christina as the bad girl of pop music. Directed by David LaChapelle, known for his controversial work, the Dirty video was exactly that, a visual that pushed boundaries and shocked audiences. By this point, Christina had already embraced her new image. She adopted the alter ego Xtina, dyed her hair black, and embellished herself with tattoos and piercings. This is around the time where she wears that iconic outfit at the BMAs. She was also doing those stints with the pussy cat dolls. This new persona was widely criticized and when the video for Dirty dropped, people went insane. The video generated massive controversy for its overtly sexual themes, including its depictions of fetishes like mud wrestling and muscle worshipping. Conservatives called for the video to be banned from MTV and it even sparked protests in Thailand. The words Thailand sex tourism and young underage girls in Thai could be read in the background. The Thai government threatened to take legal action. This video was stank. Extraordinarily sexual dancing, sweaty bodies everywhere, a whole boxing section, niche kinks, just gutter butt nasty. Naturally, people began comparing it to Britney's Slay For You. Both songs marked the beginning of their good girl gone bad eras with risque attitudes, outfits, and magazine covers. And both videos served as a way for Britney and Christina to escape their bubblegum pop star images. They were sweaty, showing tons of skin, and the lyrics were the most provocative that either had ever seen. Dirty is also a song that is iconic today, but kind of flopped on the US charts, peaking at number 48. Similarly, both Britney's Britney album and Christina's Stripped received mixed reviews upon release, which is surprising considering Stripped has gone on to receive critical acclaim, and is often cited as one of the most influential pop albums of all time, and is widely considered to be her best album, which it is. On the other hand, Britney's self-titled album is kind of forgettable. It has some amazing songs, don't get me wrong, but I feel like In The Zone, which was released two years later, does a much better job at showcasing Britney's transition from teen pop act to a more adult artist. Critics felt the same and I still feel like In The Zone is a top three Britney album. The feud comes to a head again in 2003 when Christina announces a joint tour with none other than Justin Timberlake. Now, I skipped over this part earlier because it's pretty much common knowledge. Early in her career, Britney started dating teen heartthrob and one of the lead singers of NSYNC, Justin Timberlake. They were the biggest pop acts of the time and everyone was obsessed with their relationship. They were the Justin and Selena of their generation. You are kind of hot, you know? You know, it's, it's funny, I was thinking the same thing about you. I, mean, I was thinking you were kind of hot too. Yeah. Yeah. 
But in early 2002, Britney entered one of the darkest periods of her life after their breakup. He tries to imply via his music video for Cry Me a River that Britney cheated on him. Hi. Okay, so I'm jumping in here to clear a few things up because I'm re-watching the Cry Me a River video and I'm getting confused. So apparently the implied storyline is that the Britney girl cheats on the guy and he finds this out by stalking her. Then he breaks into her house to film himself hooking up with another woman to get back at her. Then plays the video as she gets out of the shower. But Wikipedia refers to the Britney lookalike as an ex-lover. So if that is the case, because Justin kept saying that the girl in the video wasn't supposed to be Britney, but he also implied in the press that she cheated on him. What you have here is a creepy guy stalking his ex in her new man and then breaking and entering to film a sex tape in her bedroom and then taunting her with it. I don't know. Anyways, this whole cheating thing isn't important to the rivalry, but I thought you still needed the background information. Brittany in her memoir says that Justin cheated on her multiple times throughout their relationship. And like any young, madly in love woman in the public eye, she stayed. But she did admit to cheating on him with her choreographer, Wade Robson, after these instances. But Justin, also young, madly in love and in the public eye, stayed after that and agreed to move past the incident. So honestly, this whole weird thing with painting her as the villain is just laughable. I won't really go any further because I'm sure you can find the information yourself, but all you need to know on my stance on the situation is she pretty, he ugly, she swan, he frog. Adding fuel to the fire, Britney's virginity, which she had previously claimed that she was saving for marriage, became a topic of public debate for some reason. Justin made subtle comments in interviews suggesting that they had been intimate, which only added to the scrutiny Britney faced. Britney has always said, and I'm quoting, good morals mean waiting to have sex until after you've been married. Did you and she live up to this during your relationship? Sure. <laughs> sure. Fast forward to 2003 and both Christina's Stripped and Justin's Justified are two of the biggest releases of the year. So they decided to do a joint tour, which I'll admit is kind of messy. Now I love Christina, but this was a little, I don't know. Yes, Christina was also close with Justin with all three of them having been on Mickey Mouse Club, but he's going on this very weird misogynistic press tour about your somewhat friend and villainizing her and her sexuality to drive sales for his record. Like I understand the business move and having a somewhat shared audience but this just feels very shady. And all this did was fuel dating rumors between Christina and Justin which stoked the flames of the so-called Britney rivalry. This little interview they did for E! News together kind of just sums up the vibe and overall energy surrounding this tour. The interviewer brings up a comment that Christina made in their Rolling Stone interview where she says that she thinks thinks Justin and Britney will get back together. This obviously makes him uncomfortable, so she tried to segue the conversation out of Britney to talk about all the girls that are always after him, but you can barely hear what she's saying because Justin is doing this weird, annoying Jeopardy whistle. It's just Justin, but I don't want to make somebody uncomfortable, so we'll just drop that subject. Well, <laughs> too late for that, don't you think? <laughs> In her memoir, Britney talks about being hurt by this and their Rolling Stone cover, but at the time, she seemed unfazed by it all. This is when you would see her in her infamous dump him shirt. Despite the rivalry narrative, they, they both continued to be mentioned in each other's interviews. Christina was asked about Britney a lot more than Britney was asked about Christina, but despite this, they always had kind words to say about each other. Britney praised Stripped on multiple occasions and even called Xtina an inspiration and later cried after her AMA's performance. Xtina even called Britney during a TRL episode where she accepted the First Lady Award. But little did they know, the rivalry would finally come to a head following the 2003 VMAs. This is where we get the infamous Britney, Christina, Madonna, and Missy Elliott performance that completely overshadowed the rest of the show. Britney comes out of a giant cake, dressed in a recreation of Madonna's iconic Like a Virgin VMA performance outfit. Christina then joins her, also dressed like 1984 Madonna, and then they start singing together and rolling around on the stage. Then Madonna herself appears, dressed as the groom, and they all start singing her song Hollywood. They're all dancing together it's very racy and then the moment happens Madonna kisses Britney then turns and goes to kiss Christina but they nearly missed the kiss on camera because MTV was too busy cutting away to catch the ex-boyfriend's reaction and then Missy Elliott comes out closing out the performance do I have to say this performance was controversial following the VMAs every major publication could not wait to break the story but there was someone noticeably missing from the articles magazine covers and blog posts Christina 
The performance quickly became known as the Britney and Madonna kiss, and that's kind of the story that grabbed everyone's attention. This sidelining of Christina may have led to some animosity between the two, and they started trading barbs via the media. It all starts with Christina's Blender Magazine article in December. Britney goes on TRL in November ahead of the issue where the host reveals a quote from Christina's interview. And I was kind of shocked to see it because I'd only heard nice things coming out of your mouth about Christina, uh, but in this new Blender Magazine, she rips into Kelly Osbourne and Beyonce, and you saying that you you had to kiss Madonna at the VMAs because you needed a gimmick. And she said, these people aren't artists, they're just performers, fake and superficial. But wait, but wait, I gotta say this, but didn't she kiss her too? Right. <gasps> That's what threw right. me off about she that. She kissed her too, right? But see, everyone's like, oh, they're, they're wanting to, you know, form a gimmick. But it's like, you know what? I'm just doing my job. The media's, they're the one who make it interpreted it that way. Yeah. I'm just doing what I do. Yeah. And if they want to interpret it and misconstrue it in their way, let them misconstrue it. Now, so. how, how do you respond to Christina, though? Because that's kind of like a personal pot shot. Like, that you know doesn't what? feel I right. don't want to say anything about her. Really? No, That's the high no, 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 no. She has an amazing voice. She's an amazing girl, but she says some things sometimes that are just kind of rude. Mm -hmm. And I don't... You're seeing class right now, ladies and gentlemen. Now she did spill. Well, sort of, kind of, because this quote, which mentioned the word gimmick and was said by the host himself, is indeed fake. Yup, 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 yup. Yup. This is not what Christina said. She never once referred to the kiss as a gimmick. Rather, she expressed disappointment with MTV for cutting to Justin's reaction and barely screening her kiss with Madonna. Christina did say some questionable things about Britney and even Beyonce, but these comments had nothing to do with the kiss. In the article, Christina reveals that the only reason she agreed to the VMA's performance was because it sounded, you guessed it, edgy. By this point, Christina's whole brand was being edgy, starting conversations, and causing controversy. Christina's edginess ranged from overt sexual shock value to bangers level cultural appropriation. However, comma, it turns out this performance didn't quite live up to ex Tina's high expectations. The VMAs were so, so vanilla, so safe, so predictable, no edge. Apart from Madonna, Mary J. Blige, and myself, I cannot think of another female performer who had her mic switched on. That is very disappointing to me. I agreed to do it in the first place only because Madonna had told me that it was mandatory to sing live. Christina suggests that although Britney sang live during rehearsals, when the show aired, she was lip singing. Who knows what happened exactly? She was supposed to, but somewhere along the line, maybe some money changed hands under the table. Now, I kind of see where Christina's coming from. It might be disheartening for an artist like Christina, who puts a lot of emphasis on the vocals, to see an artist not sing live. But let's be real, this criticism doesn't entirely hold up. Christina herself does not sing live all the time. And Despite Britney's reputation, she does sing live. Not every performance, sure, but she's done it, and that's a fact. Also, Britney never claimed to be Whitney Houston. Crazy, out of this world vocalist, no. She is a decent singer, but her brand has always been about her unique stage presence and performing abilities, something she's been known for since her Mickey Mouse Club days. Christina goes on to say that no one is bold the way she is bold. She criticizes people like Beyonce and Britney for pretending to be sweet and virginal in interviews, but then doing extremely sexual photo shoots. Come on girl, stop contradicting yourselves. If you want to do those magazine covers and those videos, then fine, more power to you. But don't revert to innocence afterward. I will not hide behind anything, ever. I'm a sexually strong female and I'm proud to be one. If anyone has a problem with that, tough. I feel like this is a very weird comment to make about how other people decide to present themselves. Obviously, this is a very nuanced topic that I'm probably not too equipped to handle, but I feel like there's a lot of projection going on in this interview. She goes on to say that Britney seemed distant and nervous during rehearsals. She seems to me like a lost little girl, someone who desperately needs guidance. And post Free Britney and knowing what we know now about the conservatorship and what Britney was going through, this part could very much be true and it's kind of sad to think about. But then Christina throws more shade saying, in our world there are different types of entertainers. You have your artists and you have your regular performers. I'm an artist and well, and while I love Christina and there are a few people in Hollywood that try her, she is no stranger to diva rumors and a lot of people call her a mean girl. After this, Britney Grace Blender's January issue and responded to Christina's comments about her being like a lost little girl who needs guidance. That's funny because I haven't seen her in two years. And then she comes up to me in a club in front of all these people and tries to put her tongue down my throat. I'm like, how are you? I say, it's good to see you. And she goes, well, you're not being real with me. I was like, well, Christina, what's your definition of being real? Going up to girls and kissing them after you haven't seen them for two years? A lost girl? I think it's probably the other way around. We, inter we actually interviewed uh, Christina not too long ago, and she said that she saw you in a club, and it was when you'd bro just broken up with Justin. Did she tell you that she tried to kiss me? 
Yes. Is that a CD UK exclusive? Yes, she did. Yeah, we were at a club and she came to me and she put her tongue down my throat. I was like, hello, I haven't seen you in two years. How are you? She likes you. Yeah, obviously. Because um, because in the meantime, she told us that she was giving you advice about the breakup with Justin and oh. stuff. Oh, she was? Okay. <sighs> Got something else going on at the time? Um, No, I don't remember talking to her about that. Right. When somebody's been rude to you so many times, it's like, you know what, Christina? I'm really not about that fake bullshit anymore. You're scared and I feel really dark when I get around you, so I need to be over here now. At this point, the feud had devolved into a series of shady comments. When Britney got engaged to that man, Christina allegedly commented that the ring looked like it was from QVC and said she knows Britney. She's not trailer trash, but she sure acts that way. And, well, was she wrong? I'll let you decide, but why are you telling this to a major news publication like Us Weekly, knowing the rumors of a rivalry? Like this is Nikki Level's Stan Twitter shade to one of your peers. Suddenly the rivalry wasn't just about perception anymore. There were actual tangible insults to dissect, giving reporters even more reason to probe into their relationship. By 2005, it seemed that some reconciliation had taken place. Christina got married and Britney was soon to follow. Christina even revealed she sent Britney a basket full of presents when she gave birth to her first son in September 2005. Right around the time Britney posted on her blog that she would love to be close with Christina again, it seemed like the girls were growing up and putting the pettiness behind them, but the comparisons didn't stop. Britney was constantly in the tabloids for a series of relationship and personal life blunders, often painted in a negative light. At this time, Christina was focused on her album Back to Basics, and this is where the narrative shifts. Britney was on a hiatus from music after a knee injury, and it was clear that they were heading in completely different directions. But with Britney being the media's punching bag, the media started comparing sharing their personal lives even more. There was a lot of drama in Britney's personal life, but when it came to Christina, things seemed to be getting better. They both revealed that they had exchanged gifts for each other's weddings and baby deliveries. And this brings us to 2007, the blackout era, a year to remember. This was the year that Britney shaved her head, the year that changed everything. She was publicly grieving her aunt's death, dealing with postpartum depression, fighting back at paparazzi who relentlessly harassed her, and going through a highly publicized divorce amidst bad mother allegations and the world sat and watched and recorded. And this paired with the fact that her ex-rival was touring, winning Grammys, and had what seemed to be the perfect family, it was just too easy for the media to compare and relish in Britney's downfall. But Christina, unlike many celebrities and even some of Britney's peers, was very kind and understanding of Britney's situation. In an interview, she actually defended her, saying that the industry was becoming harder on people and that no one should judge because people didn't know what Britney was going through. Christina allegedly reached out to Britney. She wrote her a letter and they exchanged back and forth for some time. It seemed like the beat was dead. But just when things seemed to be resolved, the rivalry was almost revived in 2012. Britney made her reality TV debut on The X Factor as a judge while Christina was starring as a coach on The Voice over at NBC. At the time, Simon Cowell tried to dredge up this old feud by telling TMZ that Britney wasn't going to appreciate the fact that Christina, who has been a bit of a rival, isn't allowing Britney to have a night of her own. Naturally, comparisons emerged once again as their careers remained on a similar trajectory. By the time the 2010s rolled around, both Britney and Christina had moved on and were quick to shut down any comparisons. Do you get along with her? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. She's a good friend. Okay. Brittany's so talented. I mean, God, you know, like all the all the touring and, and everything. You know, a lot of these people, they come on the show, they just want to know, you know, how do I get out there? How do I own it? How do I get the stage presence? How do I control my nerves? You know, how do I connect with the audience? And, you know, I mean, she's she's a pro. She's She's been at it for a number of years now. We did grow up together, basically. So, you know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's actually cool that, you know, these strong women are, are joining the club and, uh, you know, they're gonna have fun. I forgot that this was also the year that Melanie Martinez auditioned for The Voice with Toxic and Christina would not turn her chair. And of course, people overanalyzed this. And then her and Melanie had their own little beef. Well, she's not even looking at me. <laughs> it's okay. Um. <laughs> the media would occasionally bring up the feud and Christina often mentioned how the media went to great lengths to try to pit the two against each other. But honestly, people stopped caring. A new set of pop girls were on the rise, earning the title of pop princess. So this alleged rivalry no longer held any weight. That is until the Free Britney movement. Now I won't do a full deep dive into the conservatorship situation. There are tons of other videos covering that. But in 2021, at the height of the movement, as Britney fans fought for her freedom, Christina was one of the few celebrities who
who publicly supported Britney's fight to end her conservatorship. She shared a really heartfelt thread about Britney, the conservatorship, and their friendship. But then at the Latin Grammys, she was asked about Britney again. Now, Christina's always asked about Britney in interviews, so this wasn't surprising, but this was Christina's moment. She was there to promote her music. So she and I'm assuming her publicist decided to avoid the question. It's really awkward though. He pulls her away and tells the interviewer, No, we're not doing that tonight. I'm sorry. Thank you. But she does end the interview saying that she's happy for Britney. But I'm happy for her. But then Britney clips this and puts it on her Instagram story and basically calls Christina out. She did make a few points. But this was Christina's moment, and Christina had already addressed Britney's conservatorship in the past. However, comma, in contrast to Lady Gaga, who mentioned Britney's situation on the red carpet of her film premiere, Christina's avoidance looked kind of bad. January 2002, Christina spoke about Britney again after the conservatorship was terminated. I couldn't be happier for her. Every woman deserves uh, to feel empowered and to own that for themselves, however they see fit. I will always be here to reach out to whatever. It's very important important now more than ever now that we do have the ability to connect um that 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 happens and that we always feel unified but later that year christina unfollowed britney after she made a post essentially body shaming christina's dancers and insinuating that she looked thinner next to them britney later deleted the post and apologized but the damage was already done this will be their last interaction before the release of britney's memoir where britney does mention christina a few times and praises her but they still have yet to work it out on the remix as i mentioned at the beginning of the video the girl versus girl narrative has been a fixture in celebrity culture for ages and i'd argue that this is one of the biggest examples of it. Today, if you stumble across a Britney or ex Tina stan on Twitter, you can bet they've exchanged a few choice words and they're one of the many long standing fan wars. This pisses me off because I'm a fan of both, but I cannot be on Britney or ex Tina stan Twitter because neither fan base can be critical of one artist without viscerally attacking the other, whether it's calling ex Tina fat or Britney a crackhead. Their fans have been going at it for decades, and let's be real, even if they were besties, stan Twitter would have found something to tussle over. And Anyway, but that's besides the point. This level of stand behavior goes way beyond the usual what is she wearing, who is she dating tabloid drama. It's the same tired trope we've seen with Beyonce and Rihanna, Nicki Minaj and Cardi B, Selena Gomez and Hailey Bieber, Lady Gaga and Madonna, Miley Selena and Demi, Ariana Grande and Mariah Carey. The list just keeps going. It's a dated form of celebrity culture and fandom behavior that honestly, I wish we would just leave behind. Anyways, that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. This video was supposed to be a lot longer. I was gonna get into the actual history of pitting women against each other, examples. I even had a Sabrina versus Olivia segment, but I feel like this is long enough. This is all I needed. I'll see you guys next time, whenever that might be. I'm hoping soon I have something really big planned. But yeah, that's it. Bye.